She came home a couple days ago. So, so, well, for her, I'm not sure because she really liked where she was. A lot of social, a lot of social. Hello, can you hear me? Here I am. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think we can start. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce to you Professor William Jagust, Jagust, who is a professor at UC Berkeley's Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute and at Public Health, where he holds the University Endowed Chair in Geriatrics. He is also a faculty senior scientist at the Berkeley National Laboratory. His research is focused on posita, positron emission tomography, PET scanning, and magnet, magnetic ins, resonance imaging, MRIs, and functional MRIs, and <clears throat> related to the study of hippocampal volume and PET imaging, imaging of brain glucose metabolism in the study of Alzheimer's disease. His laboratory is also engaged in studies that combine PET imaging with brain dopamine and beta amyloid, amyloid depositions. And I should add, in connection with all of that, that I am one of his subjects and have been <laughs> and have been for maybe the last eight or ten years. So who knows what's going on upstairs here? He does. Prior to joining the Berkeley faculty in 2004, uh, uh, Bill was a member of the faculty member uh, faculty at UC Davis, where he was director of its Alzheimer's Disease Center and chair of neurology in the School of Medicine. And he's uh, the author of many, many articles. He's an extremely busy guy, and I think we're extraordinarily fortunate to have him come and talk to us today. And, uh, and in two weeks, he will be also giving a lecture on Alzheimer's disease. So for this week, he is here. Next week, uh, his associate, Brian Mander, who is also in the sleep lab, will be talking about sleep and the measurement of uh, brain during sleep and, and, uh, and its relationship to aging. So it's a remarkable and interesting series. And, uh, and without further ado, I will turn the microphone over to Professor Jacobs. Please give him a big hand. So thank you. Thank you very much, Al. Can you all hear me? Yeah, I heard a few no's. Uh, maybe, maybe, should I talk? Does this work better? Well, how about now? Yeah? All right, all right, let's try this. So, okay, so, um, 
So actually, uh, I want to start a little bit by apologizing. The, the, the first talk, this lecture today, is going to be kind of basic. And um, I think you'll still find it interesting. I hope you'll find it interesting, because it's a very basic talk about memory. Uh, and we're going to talk about memory, and we're going to talk about memory and aging in some very, very general terms. And I know you're going to have a lot of questions, um, and I'm probably not going to answer them because I want you to come back for, my third, for the third lecture in this series. <laughs> I don't make any money off of this, let me tell you. Uh, but but um, the sec as you heard from Al, the second lecture is on sleep and memory. And the third lecture is going to be about aging and sort of what's normal aging and what's Alzheimer's disease and what's the border of those two conditions. Is there a border? How are they related to one another? And when, I find that when I... Um, talk about that, there's a lot of interest and a lot of questions. So I, I want to sort of tantalize you to come back for that third lecture. But today, I'm really going to talk about how memory is, where memory lives in the brain, how the brain remembers, uh, and how some of these things might be affected by aging. So, um, so it's not going to be too specific. Uh, it actually, uh, it's actually fairly general. But I think if you uh, don't understand the concepts today, it'll be harder. You'll, or if you understand the concepts today, you'll get more out of the next two lectures. So let me just begin. Um, you know, so I think of myself as a, as a cognitive neuroscientist. I'm interested in uh, and how the brain produces cognition. So that's cognition and neuroscience. And cognitive neuroscience actually has a long history. N not all of it is so distinguished. Uh, and this is, this is some of that. Um, so, you know, our thinking about the brain, I think, uh, going back over 100 years, was very rudimentary and what we would say uh, localizationist. That is, what, what different behaviors do different brain regions perform? And, you know, the height of that, or maybe the, the depth of that, was phrenology with the idea that you could actually infer something about a person's behavior or cognition by feeling their scalp and measuring their scalp. And to be honest, uh, the first part of the 20th century wasn't a whole lot different. We were looking a little more refined ways, but we were still thinking in terms of, you know, what part, what, is, what does this part of the brain do? Uh, is this part of the brain responsible for memory? Is this part of the brain responsible for language? Is this part of the brain responsible for planning and so forth? And I think as uh, things have developed, especially with the advent of tools like functional MRI and recording electrical activity from the brain, uh, we've got a much more... Uh, oops. Well, that's a good start. Okay, here we go. <laughs> So we've got a much, I turned it off, uh, we've, got a, we've got a much more modern concept of this, which is <clears throat> we're asking the questions now, what are the computations that a brain region performs? And um, some of that uh, I'll talk a little bit more about again in, 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 in a couple of weeks. And what does the computation that a brain region perform that, that subserves a certain kind of behavior, and how do different brain regions work together to produce a cognitive function. So not just one region, but different regions interacting to produce a cognitive function. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about the nomenclature of memory, because it's actually quite confusing. Um, and some of the terms you've probably heard are long-term memory and short-term memory. So I'm mostly going to be talking about long-term memory, but long-term in, in, in the next few, that's what we're going to be talking about in the next few lectures. But long-term memory is a relatively meaningless term. It generally indicates that we're talking about processing some kind of information and retaining it over some long period of time. Not seconds or minutes, but generally hours. Uh, and it involves a number of different processes, which we refer to as encoding, so getting the information in, uh, consolidating it, somehow tying it together, storing it somewhere so that it, it, can be, uh, it, can be, it can be retrieved later, and then retrieval. So these are the different sort of different processes involved in memory, and I'll, I'll go into these in a bit more detail. And it heavily relies on a part of the brain we call the medial temporal lobe, particularly the hippocampus, and we'll be spending a fair amount of time talking about that. So that's in contrast to short-term memory, which is kind of a memory buffer. Uh, this is the idea that we retain memory for a very brief period of time during which we have access to it and can use it, and then if we don't use it, it's gone. So 
I, I, know, I, I know I'm not talking down to you. I know you're retired. You're probably in the same age cohort as I am, so you're all familiar with looking up a telephone number. Uh, <laughs> no one does that anymore, right? You, 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 don't, you don't have to do that. But in the old days, we would go to a phone book or a little thing we had in our wallet or in our purse or whatever and look for a phone number, walk over to the phone and dial the number, right? And that's, that's this short-term memory buffer because once you're done with the phone call, that number's gone, at least if you only use it once. And that's what we mean by short-term memory, and that's often called working memory. And I'm really not much going to be talking about that today other than to contrast it with other kinds of memory. So let's get into long-term memory. That's also complicated. There's, there's multiple <laughs> kinds of long-term memory, and I want to start with the idea that there's something called explicit and implicit memory. Explicit is also called declarative memory, and implicit is called, is called uh, non-declarative. Um, so implicit, explicit memory is memory that's subject to conscious awareness. Um, you can tell me about it, basically. Uh, you can tell me that you remember something. But implicit memory is really not conscious. You have to show me by showing me that you can do something or remember something. And I'm really not much going to talk about this implicit memory. Uh, a big example of implicit memory are things like skills, motor skills. We don't think of motor skills as memory, but if you learn how to ride a bicycle, that's a kind of memory. Uh, that memory, people use the word muscle memory, but as a neuroscientist, let me tell you, your muscles don't have any memory. It, it, it's all in your brain. Uh, and that is, uh, those kinds of motor skills involve certain systems and circuits in the brain that we know are subject to different kinds of disease processes than the kinds of problems that we get into with other types of memory. So, so, um, so that's, that, that's, that's implicit memory. Explicit memory uh, generally falls into the category of memories for facts and memories for events. So again, I'll go into these in a little more detail. Um, <clears throat> so implicit memory, like I said, you demonstrate by doing it, riding a bicycle, playing the piano. Uh, priming is a way psychologists test this in the lab where a previous stimulus that you see sort of affects the way you respond to a subsequent stimulus. You don't, you, it, it may be very unconscious, but if you've seen something before and you see something afterwards, that something afterwards is responded to differently based on what you'd previously seen. So that's priming. But uh, explicit memory has a, a lot of different ways of looking at it. And, and you know, remembering things that you're told, whether it's a list of words or something your spouse tells you or whatever is explicit memory, uh, or remembering things in the distant past, like something that happened to you 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or when you were a child. So let's talk more about explicit memory, because again, I'm trying to sort of drill down into these different kinds of memory and talk about the kind that's most interesting to me uh, and the kind that um, changes uh, as mo the most as we get older. So that's explicit memory, and we generally um, uh, separate the explicit memory into memory for facts and memory for events. So memory for facts is also often called semantic memory. I know it's a lot of terminology. Uh, I make students learn this, um, so you should too. Uh, it's only fair. Um, so semantic memory is memory, uh, is memory for facts. And um, let me give you the examples. And you know, So you m all know that Sacramento is the capital of California. And you know that this thing, when you see a picture of it or you see it in real life, you call it an apple. Um, so that's semantic memory. In a way, it's knowledge, and it's knowledge about lots of things. It's knowledge about the world. It's knowledge about, uh, about words and concepts. Um, but the key interesting thing about semantic memory is you can't tell me when you learned it. You cannot tell me when you learned that that thing was called an apple. And you can't tell me when you learned that Sacramento is the capital of California. At some point, you obviously had to learn it, because you, you weren't born knowing these things. So you, you had to learn it, but it's become so well encoded in your brain that you no longer have a recollection of the event that occurred when you learned that information. And that's the crucial difference between memory for facts and memory for events, which we call episodic memory. So semantic memory versus episodic memory, memory for an event or an experience. So what do I mean? It's memory that's linked to a place and time. So an example of that is what you did this morning, or a list of words I might give you to remember. And I'm going to get into that in a little more detail. But if you understand the concept of an event linking a place and time, 
you'll really grasp something very fundamental about what memory is. So let me give you, let me give you a, a more sort of a richer example. Suppose I ask you to remember what you were doing during breakfast this morning, or what you had for breakfast, okay? <clears throat> if you're like me, you have the same thing every day. Pretty boring. Think back. How are you going to remember that? So it may just come to you, because it's a, it's a strong memory. But chances are, you'll picture where you were. And you'll picture what the light in the room was like. Maybe you had the radio or television on, or you were talking to, something, to someone. Uh, there were certain smells in the room. So it's a, it's a complex event that involves all your senses. It involves sight, taste, touch, smell, sound. And that memory might not come back to you immediately as its full richness, it might come back as a little part, like you say, oh yeah, I was listening to you know, NPR and they had a story about Donald Trump. Uh, pretty, pretty good guess, right? Uh, and then you say, oh yeah, yeah, and then you know, it was dark over there and, and I remember, and you'll reconstruct the event. So that event is a network of different perceptions that are all tied together. And somehow those different perceptions, those different aspects of what you were doing for breakfast are tied together into this memory. And that's what memory fundamentally is. It's linked to a place and a time. It's got a stamp on it that tells you, this happened to me, I was here, this was the time, and this is what I remember. So, <clears throat> so that's pretty much what I'm going to be talking about today is episodic memory. And I, I should also point out that, 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 so that there's a lot of aspects to this because we can talk about learning it and then remembering it. So here's another way to think about learning and, and, and remembering, and that's in terms of having an illness. Um, and the, the word we use when we talk about an illness that affects memory is amnesia. Amnesia is a disorder that affects memory. And unfortunately, there are many causes of amnesia, but unfortunately, a, a fairly common one is a head injury. So, so let's, let's talk about this in terms of a head injury. So let's say a person wakes up in the morning, has breakfast, uh, gets on their bicycle, and is riding to work, and then gets hit and gets knocked in the head and brought to the emergency room and then transiently unconscious and then wakes up. So that, per, that, that getting hit in the head is this red, red bar here. That's the disease. And it's very common after a head injury to have lost the memory for the events that happened right before the injury. So that person might recall uh, waking up and having breakfast, but they might not remember the event of the injury, and they might not even remember being on their bicycle. They might remember the last thing in the morning was getting on their bicycle. That's all called a retrograde amnesia. That's because that information was never processed properly because it needed some time to get processed. And the brain got whacked before the person could do that processing. And then after the injury itself, if the person doesn't remember anything when they're waking up in the emergency room, they may, let's say they come through this, are perfectly fine, they go back to work, everything's okay, but they're gonna have a period of time, perhaps, surrounding this injury when they don't remember the things that happened before them, the injury, and they don't remember the things that happen after the injury. And the things that happen after the injury are things like, you know, the doctor coming in and being interviewed and all of that. And they, they, they may not remember that. They may never remember that. And that's because during this period of time, when they were getting all this new information, it couldn't be put together the way you put together a memory because the brain wasn't functioning properly. It just couldn't be linked up, these different aspects of the experience, the different aspects of the events couldn't be linked up and put together. So that's another insight into how memory functions. Um, have any of you ever seen anyone with a severe amnesia? Very few. Okay, I'm going to show you someone. Um, this is an old video, but I think it still does the trick, and it's kind of long. So I'm probably not going to show you the whole thing, but I want you to see what someone with amnesia is like. And this is not an older person. This is, this is a person who has something called Korsakoff syndrome, um, which is a very, very rare condition, um, but it's caused by um, 
uh, alcoholism, actually. Um, and uh, so, uh, well, this is, I did this. I'm proud of it. But this is his, um, this is what it's like when I was interviewing him. I just wanted to ask you a few questions, um, seeing how you're doing and things of that sort. Is that all right? It's all right. Good. Let me start by asking you um, how you got here. This time or overall? This time. This time I got here by virtue of a trauma accident that I had where I was staying before and they thought that I might receive better care okay. here. Okay. Well let me ask you, let me go back a step and ask you another question and that is what's the name of the place that we're in here? Where are we? This is Somewhere in Berkeley. Okay. What kind of place is it? It's a general hospital. Right. Okay. This is Highland Hospital. Highland Hospital. And we're in Oakland. Okay. Okay. And um, okay. So good. You um, tell me again now what exactly happened to bring you here. Um. Well, that's okay. That's okay if you're not sure. Look, how are you feeling now? Uh, right now, um, fairly well. Okay, good. Uh, you have no pain, discomfort of any sort? No. Good. Okay. No. Do you know what the date is today? No, I don't. Can you, you want to take a guess? Um, what year is it? Do you know what year it is? 95. It's 94. It's 94. It's 94. <clears throat> and today is May 19th. Okay. Okay? And do you know the place we're at, where we are? Um, some major hospital in Berkeley. Okay. It's actually Highland Hospital. Highland, okay. In Oakland. In Oakland. In Oakland. Yeah. Have you heard of Highland Hospital? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's where we are, is Highland Hospital. And it's May 19th, 1994. Okay, and I'm going to give you some other questions here. Um, suppose, you, uh, suppose you went to the store, okay, with $2, and you bought something for uh, 65 cents. Mm -hmm. How much change would you get back? $1.35. Okay. Very good. Do you, know, uh, do you know the name of the place that we're in here now? No. Have I told it to you? I don't believe so. Okay. So th this particular place, I knew the, the place we were in before. What was that? I think that was Berkeley General Hospital. Okay. Is that right? Uh, no, I don't think so. You actually, we're in Highland now. Highland Hospital. Okay. And that's where you've been all along. Okay. Why did you come here to the hospital? What was wrong with you? Do you recall? All right, I'm not going to, I think you get the point, right? Um, I, I, I gave him, uh, one of the things I did, I, I won't, take you through the whole thing, but I gave him a list of like three words to remember. I, I said cat, apple, and table. And then I distracted him, we talked about something else, and I said, can you tell me the words I gave you before to remember? And, and what do you think he did? What do you think he said? He said, what words? So he has no ability to encode information. He has no ability to learn. I mean, you know, giving a list of words can be complicated. I mean, I wouldn't want to take some of the tests that we give our subjects. Uh, but remembering that you're in Highland Hospital, right? I mean, that he couldn't even retain that, right? So, so in contrast, he was doing fine, right? I mean, he's, I mean, again, I don't want to play the whole story for you, but um, he talks perfectly well, he's conversant, he understands what I'm saying to him. He did that mental arithmetic really quickly, didn't he? Uh, he's sharp, right? He's sharp in every respect, except he can't remember anything. And it shows you how incredibly circumscribed amnesia can be, how, how it can be a, a severe, devastating uh, a problem, and yet relatively limited to just memory. He could not live independently with this, right? There's no way. 
So, so um, it's really pretty remarkable. So now we'll talk about some of the brain systems that are involved in memory. And um, I want to start with talking about the hippocampus. So this is kind of a funny little thing. The hippocampus is flashing there. Um, uh, but it, it sort of gives you the picture. Well, one of the things about the brain is you really have to be able to visualize it in three dimensions. And um, the hippocampus is kind of in the middle of the temporal lobe. So these are the temporal lobes here. And I'm going to show you in a second what it looks like. You can't really see it unless you slice the brain. And we're going to slice the brain in this, in this direction, which produces what's called a coronal image of the brain. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. And now, so here's a side view of the brain, and we've cut through it to produce this coronal image, and you can sort of see it here and here. So this is the outside surface of the brain here, and this is the medial surface of the brain here, and this is the hippocampus. And we tend to use words like hippocampus sometimes a little loosely, but it's a, really there's a hippocampus and there's other parts of the brain called the entorhinal cortex, which is right next to the hippocampus here. Uh, and together, this is really the crucial uh, one of the crucial uh, sets of structures involved in creating memories. So um, the, way the, the way we we understand that this works is partly through tracing the pathways of the, of the connections between nerve cells. And one of the things we understand is that this whole outside, the whole the whole lateral surface and a lot of the medial surface of the brain is responsible for perceiving the world and integrating it in ways that we know. Uh, we see colors and shapes that eventually we recognize as objects as they're processed more and more uh, in more and more detail in the cortex. And that information all gets transmitted into the hippocampus through this sort of relay station uh, in this area of the brain called the entorhinal cortex. And then it, this information goes from the entorhinal cortex into the hippocampus. And we think that fundamentally what the hippocampus does is bind all these different aspects of an event together so that we remember them as a single memory. So and remember, when I talked about having your breakfast, I talked about all the different aspects of that breakfast, the time of day, the day of the week, the, the, the perceptions of you know, food and taste and and, and vision, and that's the memory. And we think that that memory is created by the hippocampus, binding all of that, those different aspects of the memory together so that you remember it as a single event. And it's a single event that, again, has a stamp on it, like your camera put, it puts a GPS stamp on it. It has a stamp of place, and it has a stamp of time. And that the hippocampus does this by taking all this information from the whole brain getting it relayed from the entorhinal cortex into the hippocampus, and the hippocampus then processes it in some way that it creates this as a memory. So we'll come back to this uh, in, in a couple of weeks when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, but this is very, very reliant on these connections between, again, now we're looking, just go back, we, we've taken this part of the brain and sort of zone, uh, homed in on this, this part here, and uh, again, um, by the way, Anyone know what hippocampus it is? Seahorse. A seahorse. Does this look a little like a seahorse? Yeah, that's, the, that's where it comes from. Uh, so so, um, so uh, this is the entorhinal cortex, and this whole process is very dependent on uh, information getting relayed from this entorhinal cortex directly into the hippocampus. And if that connection uh, breaks down, you get into problems uh, with, with memory. So um, we know from uh, a number of different kinds of evidence that bilateral hippocampal damage causes very, very severe uh, amnesia, and I would say anterograde amnesia, and we'll, we'll talk about how we know that in just a minute. Uh, it, it doesn't affect retrieval of remotely stored memories, so damaging the hippocampus doesn't affect remotely stored memories, but it affects the ability to create new memories. And, um, and these other parts of the brain, like the parahippocampal gyrus and the entorhinal cortex, are, are part of that whole medial temporal lobe memory system. So I, when I use the word hippocampus, I sometimes don't go into the detail, and, but it involves these other structures like, that are right next to the hippocampus. So how many have heard of H.M.? He was in the news a lot lately. Um, so he, um, he was probably one of the most famous um, 
uh, case studies in the history of neuroscience. Um, <clears throat> very, very famous. Uh, he died of, uh, of oh, oh, let's see, when did he die? I, I have his, part of his obituary here. I can't actually see. Uh, 2008. So he died in 2008. Um, he was studied for about 30 years before he died uh, by a number of very prominent neuroscientists. Um, he was in the news recently because there was, uh, someone wrote a book about the scientist who studied him, and it was a very controversial book. Um, but that's another story. Um, so so he, he is, uh, as I say here, the archetype of human amnesia, and the detailed studies of him have told us a great deal about amnesia. Um, when he was 27 years old, he had a surgery for epilepsy. He had intractable epilepsy. They couldn't treat it with medications. And to this day, we still treat epilepsy with surgery by removing the, 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 the tissue that is, uh, that is starting the seizures. But at the time he had his surgery, um, uh, things were not understood as well as they are today. And unfortunately, they took out his hippocampus and, hippocampal, and parahippocampal gyrus on both sides of the brain, not knowing what that would do to him. And, um, and uh, he, um, he actually, his seizures actually did improve, but he developed a severe amnesia, uh, and he couldn't learn any new facts. So his immediate recall, what we were calling working memory or short-term memory, was fine. So he could, for example, look up a phone number. He could you know, recite a list of numbers and go dial, dial them, and that, he could do that just fine. But um, he, he couldn't form a new memory. And in fact, uh, it's remarkable to read some of the things that his, uh, his, uh, the scientists who worked with him um, wrote about him. Uh, uh, one of them uh, was named Suz uh, Suzanne Corkin, and um, she, she, she spent like, you know, months of her life with him, and she would spend hours and hours testing him and go away and come back, and he wouldn't remember who she was. Uh, and she, eventually, he figured out that she was important, and he thought that she was a, 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 an important politician. Um, uh, but he never really figured out who she was. Um, so in contrast to all that, he actually did remember things that had happened to him when he was a child. So he was able to retain uh, where he grew up and information about his parents. So that tells us something very, very important about the hippocampus, that you don't actually need it to get back memories that have been well stored. The information isn't stored in the hippocampus. What the hippocampus does, it links it all up together to store it, but once the information is stored as a memory, you don't actually need the hippocampus anymore. And HM was very important in demonstrating that to us. So this is, um, this is actually HM. Um, uh, shows you the operation he had, um, you know, uh, the black areas of the parts of the brain that were removed. Again, <clears throat> you're seeing this here in the side view of the brain. That's a, sort of a, as if you, as if you um, sectioned it this way, and this is a coronal image, and these black areas are the parts of the brain where uh, the tissue was removed. Um, and this is actually a picture of him. Um, you know, I, I don't know, he looks like he's in his 50s or so there. Um, uh, it was, uh, no one knew who he was during his life. Well, obviously, the people who worked with him did, but he, it was very secret. But after he died, um, he became sort of a celebrity. Um, and uh, this is his, uh, again, this is showing you his surgery here just on one side of the brain, but it, it's actually bilateral. And here's a scan of the brain, an MRI scan, and this big black area with an asterisk in it is where the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe should be, but they're gone because of the surgery. So uh, again, he could not learn anything new uh, in terms of um, declarative memory, but just to point out that declarative memory and procedural memory are very different, he actually did fine in procedural memory. So this is a tough kind of skill to learn. What, he, what, what is going on here on the left-hand side is that someone is tracing the outline of that star, but the only visual input they have to see it is in a mirror. So, every, so everything's backwards. So you can imagine when you start to do this, it's not that easy, right? But you learn it. You get better at it. And, um, and, and um, Everyone gets better at it, and so did HM. So this is uh, essentially uh, 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 the number of mistakes he made over time. And you can see they just go down. Uh, and he was able to retain it over long periods of time. So he could learn a motor skill. And that's because the motor system doesn't rely on the hippocampus to form these kinds of memories. So, um, so he did, uh, again, he, he taught us a lot about memory, specifically that 
you know, that declarative and procedural memory are quite different, that, again, his semantic memory was also quite good. He could remember facts that he'd learned uh, previously. Um, uh, so so, so uh, uh, stored information was perfectly well retained. Okay, so that's kind of the very basics of memory. Now let's talk a little bit about what happens in aging. So in aging, we're concerned not just with memory, we're concerned with cognition across the board. Um, and there's, there is a lot of different ways of sort of parcelating cognition in terms of what the brain is doing. And um, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but we can split cognition into areas like memory, uh, episodic memory, which I've been talking about, semantic memory. Uh, we also talk about working memory. We also talk about things like executive function, which is solving problems, uh, attention, um, uh, uh, coming up with strategies, visual spatial ability, things like finding your way around, and so forth. And so we like to parcelate cognitive functions by giving people tests that test these cognitive functions uh, as, as much as we can, teasing them apart and, and examining how people do on, on different things. And uh, th this is revealed as we've studied older people a number of things, but one of the profound ones is that different cognitive functions change differently with age, and different people change differently with age. So let me give you an example and show you actual data to give you uh, an idea of what I'm talking about. So this is, this is sort of, this is cross-sectional data looking at, inf looking at how people perform at one point in time. Uh, and on the x-axis is age, and on the y-axis is their performance, and the higher they do, the better. And, um, well, it's a little depressing. All these lines go, go down, right? <laughs> uh, so as we get older, we're getting worse on all of these things. But actually not at the same rate. And let me just point out this one, right? We're, this one doesn't change very much at all. So what is that? That's, that's called word knowledge there, but it's semantic memory. And actually, when you study older people, one of the things that actually improves is vocabulary. Um, and so semantic memory and information about the world in general actually keeps getting better. And as we age, it, it, it probably does start to decline, but very, very slowly. Um, and so semantic memory is not really that much affected by age. But these other things are, these are different measures of, um, I don't know if you can, it says word, uh, word retention and story retention. These are, these are um, uh, people's ability to remember a story or a list of words. So those are, those are going down. So, so a lot of these are declining. Uh, this is visual spatial ability. Frankly, uh, this also doesn't decline at quite the same rate. Uh, as some of these other things. So the, across the board, everything doesn't go down at the same rate. But here's where it's really interesting, is when you start to look at different people. Now each of these, just focus on the right half here, and each of these lines is a person, right? So I think, um, let's just look at uh, story retention up here. So this is, uh, they read a, a, a short story, it's a, like you know five sentences long, <clears throat> and then they ask the person, uh, the, uh, after about five minutes, they ask the person questions about the story. And uh, uh, you can see that there are some people that are really having trouble, right? Um, this is change over time. So these people are really, really declining. And then there are some people in here that are declining also at a slower rate. And then there are people who are not declining at all. And then there's people getting better. And um, actually, it's not uncommon to see people improve on these tests because um, people get better both at taking the test, they learn what's expected of them, they become more comfortable in the testing environment, and to some extent they probably remember the actual stimuli. Um, so, so you see everything from improvement, uh, slight improvement, to stability, to mild decline, to severe decline. And that's the key feature of aging. And I, I, when I teach things about aging to the students in my classes, one of the things I really stress is that aging, the most remarkable thing about aging is the individual variability. Older people are much more interesting than young people because they're much more different from each other. <laughs> so, I mean, and this sort of gives you, again, just a, a sort of an overview of uh, how types of uh, memory are differentially susceptible to aging. So again, here you have episodic memory, which tends to decline the most, working memory sort of intermediate, and semantic memory really not much at all. So again, that's the reason I spend so much time talking about different kinds of memory. 
because age doesn't affect them all in the same way. So now let's just talk a little bit about how sort of the current kind of workhorse of memory testing. Now, this isn't, um, uh, this is a rather crude way of testing memory, uh, but it has worked pretty well. Um, and so let me just sort of take you through this. And it's, it's, it's pretty simple. So basically, um, a, a person is giving the same stimuli over and over again on multiple trials. So they give, might get a, 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 a series of pictures. Usually, we use words. So we'll give a list of words, 16 words, and we'll literally read those words to a person. And then we'll ask them to tell us what those words were. Uh, and if they can't remember, we'll give them cues. And then we do it again, and again, and again. And each time they have the opportunity to spontaneously tell us what those words are. We call that free re recall. And it, if they can't get them, we give them a cue. So it might be a semantic cue or a phonological cue, like a sound or a category or something like that. Um, and after we're done with a number of trials, in this case six, we have a delay, might be 15 or 20 minutes, during which they're doing something else, and then we do it again. And one of the most sensitive measures of changes in memory is this delayed recall, and especially this delayed free recall. So let me just show you these data. What this shows you is these are four different age groups. And the first thing I'll show you is the older the group is, the lower their performance. So people who are older have a harder time remembering these words than people who are younger. But everyone is getting better. So each time they have a trial, they recall more words. So they improve over time, but the younger people, in this case, people in their 60s, are doing better than people in their 90s. Uh, and then after the delay, performance falls off a little bit, but still the same general pattern. And with cued recall, people do much better. And uh, if you look at this across uh, 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 age, you see, again, here's the total number of words recalled. And you see there's a decline with age that is pretty significant. So this is a very um, reproducible finding uh, that these word list, um, uh, these word list uh, 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 tasks, uh, uh, people get worse as they age. Now, let me just pause for a minute and, 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 and address something that confuses a lot of people. So I, I've spent a while telling you that the names of things are semantic memory. And so people might say, well, you're giving them words to remember. Isn't that semantic memory? Why is this episodic memory that you're testing? Do you know why? Because we're testing the event that I gave them the word. I'm not asking them about the knowledge of the word. I'm asking them to go back in time, 15 minutes, and remember what I told them, 15 minutes. So I'm asking them to pull out that event, that event. Uh, someone, a very distinguished scientist, um, describe memory as mental time travel. So that's another way to think about it, right? I'm not asking, if I give a list of words and they're flowers and animals and whatever, I'm not asking them the semantic information. What is a flower? You know, what does this dog look like? I'm asking them to remember the event during which I gave them those words. And so they have to travel back in time to do that. So that's, that's an important, uh, again, an important um, idea in, in, in terms of what memory is. So, um, so now let me just, I, I want to get to some of the other problems that happen in aging. So it's helpful to think about this in terms of the difference between free recall and cued recall. So if I give someone a list of 16 words, and 20 minutes later I say, what were those words? That's free recall. Um, you have to really work at it to be able to remember those things. And most people use different kinds of strategies. So what kind of strategy might you use if I gave you 16 words? Well, you might chunk them together and remember groups of them, like three or four together. Or maybe they're categories. So you might remember that, you know, oh, I, there were three of them were things you buy in a grocery store. Um, you know, that's a relatively simple example. But people use very complicated strategies to remember things. But we all do it. And most of us do it in a very automatic way. Um, it, it's not, we're not trying to create, you know, um, stage acts of memory. We're, we're just, we all do it in our daily life of ways to remember things. So we need, we need strategies in terms of how we remember and how we retrieve the information, right? Whereas if, if you have to do cued recall, you don't really need those strategies because we're giving them to you. We're saying, 
One was a flower, you know, or one began with the letter B. Do you remember the B, 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 and people can get it. So in general, everyone, but older people as well, uh, perform more poorly on tasks that require this strategic behavior. So they do worse on this, on free recall uh, and better on cued recall. Uh, and cued recall gives the strategies uh, to, to individuals. So that brings me to another way of thinking about memory, and that is this idea of recollection versus familiarity. And again, this is something you're all familiar with, but you, you, you probably haven't thought about it in these particular terms. So recollection is a precise recall of an event, and familiarity is a less precise sense of knowing some aspect of the event. So I'll give you an example that happens to me all the time probably happens to you too. I'm out somewhere and I see someone and I know that person, right? I know that person. The last time, so, and I'll struggle and I say, I know that person. So that's familiarity, right? I can't tell you who the person is. Last time it happened to me, you know, two hours later, I realized it was someone who was a, someone who was a clerk in a store that I go to often, right? Stuff like that. And you think, oh, wow, this is my best friend's best friend or someone I know really well. You know, it's basically someone I, 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 I interact with in a store. But, but that's familiarity, the sense that you know something, but you can't precisely tell me what it was. That's memory, right? It's just not a very precise memory. But recollection is a precise memory of an event. So again, if you see that person, if you meet them once, and you remember, oh yeah, that was the person I saw at such and such a store, at such and such a day, that's recollection. That's a precise memory. So again, these things really decline differently. And um, familiarity is much better preserved than recollection when we talk about aging. Um, it's also more similar uh, to uh, acute uh, recall in a way. The idea that you can recognize something uh, when you're given a strategy is sort of akin to this idea of familiarity, that you recognize it. You recognize it as something you know, but you can't say precisely what it is. And uh, I'm, I'm telling you all this because it's sort of phenomenologically very interesting, but uh, to be quite honest with you, we don't understand the neuroscience of the difference of these things. Um, it's an observation about behavior, but we don't really understand precisely where recollection and familiarity live in the brain. We think they're in different parts of this medial temporal lobe uh, memory system, but we really don't, don't have this very clear. So I want to sort of now spend just a little time on other... Are we doing okay? I have until four, right? But I, I'm not going to go that long. Maybe another 10, 20 minutes. Yeah. So, uh, 10 minutes, yeah. So... Um, so I just, I just want to, uh, uh, you know, I started out at the beginning saying we don't believe that there are regions of the brain that just perform a single task, that we think they're parts of networks. And um, with memory, that's really true. And if we think about the memory network, I've already told you about the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex, and I'm going to show you that that part of the brain shrinks as we get older. But we also know that the prefrontal cortex, especially, also shrinks, and that's involved in memory, too. So how do we know this? Well, we know it from, from a lot of different ways, but one of them is these MRIs. So we can do MRIs, and we can outline regions of the brain, and that's what we're doing. That's what's illustrated here, just measuring the size of different brain areas, and we can measure the hippocampus, and we can measure the frontal cortex. And when we do that, one of the things that's been well reported in the literature is that as the brain atrophies... This is what's happening over here. Memory is declining. So that fits with everything I've been telling you. We know the hippocampus shrinks as we get older. And as it shrinks, memory shrinks proportionally. Now, there's a lot of variability, right? This is, not, this is a trend in the data, meaning the smaller the hippocampus, the worse memory. But, you know, here's someone uh, with a pretty small hippocampus whose memory is pretty bad. And here's someone with about the same size hippocampus whose memory is quite good. So it's not... It's not, it's not deterministic, it's an association, but it's a pretty strong association that holds up uh, over a lot of different data. But that's not the only brain region that declines, and so here what I'm showing you is shrinkage of the brain in the entorhinal cortex, in the hippocampus, and also in the prefrontal cortex. And so the frontal lobes of our brain also, also shrink, and also, shrinkage in this brain region is associated with declining memory. So it's not just the hippocampus. It's also the frontal cortex. 
And to make things even more complicated, the white matter that underlies the connections between the hippocampus and the frontal cortex also undergoes a sort of degenerative change with aging. And we can see on MRI these things that we call white matter hyperintensities. So these are showing up in the white matter of the brain, which is sort of here in these fiber pathways that connect up the different parts of the brain together. And these are associated with vascular disease. What do I mean by that? They're more common in people with hypertension, for example, and diabetes. And we know that as these white matter hyperintensities increase, memory performance gets worse. So now we have sort of three different parts of this story, right? One part is the hippocampus, which I've been telling you about in terms of its role in memory, and we know it shrinks with aging. The other part of this white matter, which connects the hippocampus and the frontal lobes and all other parts of the brain, and that undergoes changes in aging that are particularly, uh, uh, particularly bad in people with um, uh, high blood pressure. And then the frontal lobes themselves seem to shrink. And we think this is a problem because it involves um, what we call executive function, because the prefrontal cortex is very involved in these strategies, in developing ways of coming up with strategies to do things in general, but also in, in memory. So, so particularly, the idea that, um, that uh, initiating things, coming up with ways to, to, to um, uh, or themes to, to code information and remember it, is a function of the prefrontal cortex. And so um, the fact that, that frontal processes decline with age, partly because of these uh, of this atrophy of the frontal lobe and partly because there's disconnection between the frontal lobe and the rest of the brain is also part of the story. And it may be one of the reasons that people have more trouble with this free recall and do better when they have cues in terms of recall. So I'm just going to end with showing you a couple of examples of how we study memory. And I'm going to show you uh, uh, an fMRI experiment that we did uh, just to show you what we see, what, 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 how we're seeing what happens during memory, which again gives you an idea of memory uh, in the brain. So for this task, we put people in the fMRI scanner, and I'm not going to go into the details. What I'll just say is that when they're in the scanner, we can measure what parts of the brain are working, okay? what parts of the brain are active. And we show them a series of pictures. So they see a picture, then a, a blank screen, then another picture, then another blank screen. And for each picture, we ask them to make a judgment. It's not important in this experiment what the judgment is. It's just to get them to pay attention to the picture. So we ask them to, uh, to, to make a judgment of whether or not there's water in the image. And so they have to press a button, yes or no. But the whole point is um, just to get them to, to pay attention to the, to the picture. So while they're looking at each of these pictures, we're recording what their brain is doing. And then 20 minutes later, when they're out of the scanner, we surprise them and we show them uh, they're sitting at a computer and we say, now we'd like to, you to look at some pictures and tell us whether you've seen them before. So what they get is all the pictures they've seen previously plus a number, a whole bunch of new pictures. So they have to work at it. They have to try to remember if they've seen the picture before or not. So what we can do is we can take the pictures that they remember and look at what was happening in their brain at the time they were seeing that picture and contrast it with the pictures they don't remember and see what the brain was doing at that point. So we can get up, we can sort of subtract, right? Just subtract one state from the other. State number one is a picture they remember. State number two is a picture they don't remember. And we can look at what their brain was doing. So this is what happens when they do this task. Now these are these are, this is everyone in our study, which is a group of uh, young and old people. Uh, I'm not going to get into the differences in this particular study. I'll show you in another. And what you see are a couple of interesting things. So these, these orangey yellow areas are areas of the brain that were turned on when they were re remembering. And these parts of the brain are the visual system of the brain. So these are the parts of the brain that are paying attention to the stimulus, and they're, in, they're obviously uh, getting all this visual information about the stimulus. This is the frontal lobe. So this is the part of the brain that was doing some kind of strategy about these stimuli. I, it, it's hard to know. Maybe it was just making the judgment of whether there was water in them. They were doing something strategic. And this is the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is turned on. So again, going back to this whole idea of memory, what was happening 
we think, is that the hippocampus was like the conductor of this orchestra of the brain. And the hippocampus is linking all these things that are happening in these parts of the brain together to create these memories for these pictures, which are like, completely trivial, right? It, it's amazing that we can do this. I mean, who cares about these pictures, right? They're, they're, they're completely trivial, and yet the hippocampus was able to link this visual information in a way that people could actually remember accurately that they'd seen the stimuli. Just for interest, these parts of the brain in blue are actually turning off. And that's a whole other st story. I'll show you a little bit about it in a minute. But it's also very important that these parts of the brain turn off during these memory processes. Because if they don't turn off, memories aren't formed as well. So these, these blue areas of the brain are all turning off when a, when a picture is remembered successfully. So what happens as we get older? So one of the things that happens is there's less activity in the hippocampus. So this is a contrast. <clears throat> it's kind of a, not a great slide, but these yellow areas are areas of the brain that are more active in young people than old, and what you're seeing is in the hippocampus, it's, the hippocampus is more active in young people than it is in old, but the frontal cortex, these yellow dots here, is actually more active in old people than young. And the less people activated the hippocampus, the more they activated their frontal cortex. So this suggests that the frontal cortex is sort of compensating for this lack of activation. And it's somehow helping to remember maybe by coming up with some additional strategy uh, to, 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 uh, to, to encode the memory. Um, so, I mean, this is a kind of a very simplistic way of thinking about what happens during memory. So we have something we have to remember, a stimulus of some sort, a picture, uh, something we hear, and it comes in and your frontal cortex is involved in remembering this because frontal cortex is involved not just in strategy, but it's also involved in attention, uh, paying attention to the stimulus. And this is connected up to the hippocampus, and the hippocampus is involved in sort of creating these links between different aspects of the memory and consolidating the memory. During retrieval, the frontal cortex is also involved because it has to sort of go back and, and, and sort of and sort of talk to the hippocampus uh, or talk to the rest of the brain about recreating this memory. And one of the things that happens in aging is we have atrophy of the frontal lobes that are interfere with encoding. We have problems with disease in the white matter, which creates difficulty in frontal hippocampal connections. And then we have hippocampal atrophy uh, itself, which uh, is involved, uh, which of course involves the actual processing that we think of as memory. And so um, what happens in, in the frontal lobe is quite complicated. We know there's atrophy. We think we lose connections between neurons and synapses. Uh, and in the hippocampus, we have atrophy. Some of this may be early Alzheimer's disease. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of weeks. Um, and some of it isn't, for sure, is not early Alzheimer's. It's something that happens as we get older that isn't Alzheimer's. So that's the end of my talk. That's my plug. I'm going to show it again. Um, I'm going to show it again in two weeks, but um, we're always looking for healthy older people who want to volunteer in our studies. Before you start asking me questions, I will tell you there's a very, very demanding study, and there's a lot of cognitive testing and PET scans that involve being injected with radioactivity. So if that turns you off, don't bother. All right, that's it. Thank you. Wow, a testimonial. <laughs> well, you know all this stuff. You know a lot of it. I'm just going to take this off. Yeah, well, if you don't do it, you know. I'm just... Dis I don't need the. If you're not going to go back, we'll disconnect it now. They're going to disconnect the taping as well. Yeah, so I don't think I need this. Yeah, stuff. make sure you got your things, and I'll get my things. <laughs> oh, is that fair?
Testing one, two, three. This is your two-minute warning. We're going to get started in about two minutes. Okay, one minute, if everyone could find their seats for the Q&A. I 
just a reminder to everyone, the next two sessions are going to be here in Sibley Auditorium in the Bechtel Engineering. And the first hour of each lecture will be taped. It looks like our experiment for streaming went very well. And so you should uh, be getting instructions from the Retirement Center about how to do one of two things. First, um, access the, the video recording of the lectures in the three-part series. There will probably be a separate link for each of the videos. And next week, if you are unable to be here but you're at home with computer access, we'll send a link out for you to uh, watch it live streaming. And if you do that, we would love to have your feedback um, because it's a new process for us. And we're learning just like everyone. So again, we'll be sending out information through um, email. So look for that from my office with information on how to access the video recordings of the three lectures, as well as how to uh, participate in the streaming on the next two, the 13th and the 20th. Are you pass that oh, I am going to walk around my best. We're very full today. Um, please try to hold the microphone close to your mouth, because then we'll get all of your words. And if, if uh, Professor, if we don't get the whole question, could you repeat it? Thank you. So first, Joyce. So I uh, apparently already expressed an interest in being in Are my you on? Oops, sorry. Some of you already expressed an interest in being in this study. Um, uh, I'm, I'll give out more information. I'll try to have some pamphlets in two weeks. But if you want to contact me, just send me an email. It's jagust, J-A-G-U-S-T, at berkeley.edu. So I'll answer your emails, sort of. <laughs> I have two questions. One about is about brain atrophy. Is anything we, is it, first of all, is it the brain cells dying off or are they? Yeah, okay. so that's a, that's a good question. So what causes brain atrophy? So again, I, I'm not gonna try to take the easy way out, uh, which would be to say that I'm gonna talk about all this in two weeks, be, <laughs> because I'm not. Uh, so so I'm, I'm happy to answer your question, but it's a, it's a complicated answer. Um, so uh, the brain shrinks for lots of different reasons. Um, and some reasons that the brain can shrink is because cells are actually dying. Uh, and that happens in Alzheimer's disease, that the brain cells actually are dying. But as we get older, our brain cells don't die. And that's been actually one of the interesting observations that has been really uh, pretty much uh, confirmed uh, a number of times now in the last 10 or 20 years. You know, people used to say, well, there are all kinds of myths about the brain, right? You know, there's that crazy one, like you only use 10% of your brain. I, I don't know where that comes from. I mean, it's, it's absolutely nonsense. Uh, but but, but um, the other one is, oh, you lose, you know, uh, you lose 10, you, you know, you lose 10 of your brain cells every 10 years or something like that. You don't, actually. As we get older, uh, there's very little brain cell death, um, unless you get sick with a disease that kills brain cells, and one of those is Alzheimer's disease. Um, what seems to be happening, and we don't completely understand how this relates to atrophy, but it's obviously correlated, is that as we get older, the synapses and the connections between brain cells uh, seem, to, uh, seem to get fewer. So if you think of a brain cell uh, as a tree, uh, it, has, it has what we call an arbor. It's, a, it's an arborized cell. Uh, and that arbor sort of shrinks and retracts. And each, though that arbor has synapses on it, which have connections between other brain cells. So it seems like it's the arbor and the connections uh, between uh, brain cells that we're losing as we get older. Obviously, I mean, that's probably not a great thing either, uh, but it's not the same thing as, cell, as brain cell death. And um, we are very, uh, we, we, we really don't understand why that happens at all. But it's probably the, the, the most um, salient uh, uh, change in structure in brain cells uh, that's associated with aging. The other thing is you mentioned diabetes and high blood pressure. What if you've been, if you're taking a lot of medications, does that help? Yeah, so diabetes and high blood pressure, um, definitely treating those, treating those conditions with medications helps. Uh, I think there have been a number of studies now to suggest that um, brain outcomes improve and, and they're much, uh, if, if high blood pressure is treated. So absolutely, uh, absolutely the outcomes are better. Um, I, I mean, I don't think that's to say that if you treat them, there's no problem, uh, because I think there still is a problem, but um, it's much 
less if, if you're treated for these things. So uh, I had this uh, word memory uh, test 10 years ago, <laughs> and I had it uh, last year because I uh, signed up for your study. And uh, I was terrible 10 years ago. Uh, I just couldn't remember any of the words, and I was just as terrible this time. <laughs> Great. Uh, now, uh, so th apparently that is not an indicator that I'm getting Alzheimer's because I'm, I'm about the same. So w what indicator can I sense in myself that would say there's something wrong? Yeah, so I mean, that's also a great question. And um, uh, so, I, uh, so again, you know, if I, if, I, um, if I, you know, if every one of you signed up for this study and we did, um, we did a memory test on you, there'd be quite a lot of variability. I already pointed that out, right, that there'd be a lot of variability. Um, some of that variability is related to how you've changed over the last 50 years, but some of it is related to how you started out, right? Um, and so that's because although I've said that older people are more variable than young people, young people are variable too, right? And everyone doesn't have the same memory. Everyone doesn't have the same size brain. Everyone said doesn't have the same size hippocampus. So there's a variation in all of this stuff, and some of this variation is just normal. And there's some people, we test their memory, it's not very good, but they, maybe they were always like that. Uh, that has very little clinical meaning, as far as we can tell. So the one thing that we're all, uh, I think, pretty, pretty certain of is the change is much more important than a single measurement. So uh, that's why, again, my study and most of the studies that are going on in this field are longitudinal. We follow people over time to see what happens to them because a single measurement doesn't really tell you very much. It tells you, you know, someone could be worse than someone else for all kinds of reasons. You could even just have a bad day, right? I mean, that's, that's fairly trivial. So I think the biggest thing is change over time. Now, that's true in the laboratory. Um, and I think we're seeing this in our data. Many people are seeing uh, that you learn a lot more in, in research by seeing things how change over, seeing how things change over time. But I think on a day-to-day -day level, you know, it's hard for me to really say very much. I mean, obviously, probably, you know. So I'm a neurologist. I don't, I don't, I don't practice uh, anymore. But I, I, I saw patients for a, a long time, and I still interact with uh, clinicians a great deal. And I think, uh, again, everyone agrees that a close family member who notices change in a family member is probably. Uh, oftentimes worth a lot in terms of information. Again, it's more useful to have a family member tell a doctor, you know, his or her memory is just, is just really declining. It's sometimes that's more useful than a memory test. Obviously, it depends a lot on the family member. I mean, <laughs> okay. You, you understand what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not, I won't go into that, but... but <laughs> But, but in general, if you have a reliable source, uh, it can be very, very useful. So I think one of the things is, is what other people around you recognize and notice. And, um, um, and then, um, you know, the other thing, of course, is that, um, you know, uh, eventually, if someone is really sick and getting worse, there's a point at which this is no longer very subtle. And um, it, it's clear that there's a problem when people start to develop... Um, uh, these kinds of difficulties that interfere with their functional ability, their ability to do, get things done in life. And so, but that's, that's a relatively late stage. So I don't know if I really answered your question fully, but I think, you know, my answer is, is basically that longitudinal measures are much more sensitive and, uh, and informants who know you are much more sensitive. I, I would also just want to point out that, you know, a lot of people think... Um, I guess we'll talk about this again a little in, in a couple of weeks, but it, it's an important point. A, a lot of people think, you know, I just want to get a measurement now so you'll sort of have a baseline, so you know where I started. And th that's a perfectly reasonable sentiment, but um, the bad news is that if we find out that you're declining, there's not much we can do for you at this point because most causes of those declines are, are not well understood. Some of them are, you know, like... Again, if you have hypertension or diabetes, that may be contributing to cognitive decline, or depression can contribute to cognitive decline. But those problems are generally not going to be picked up by doing memory tests. They're, they're going to be picked up in a doctor's office or, or by your family or something like that. So I, I, think, I think the actual sort of clinical need for memory tests 
is really, really, really limited. Uh, it's limited to people who are having real problems. Along the lines of individual variability, are the words given visually, orally, or both? Yeah, it's interesting. Usually, uh, it's uh, orally. It's, aud it's, uh, it's auditory. Although, although there are different variations of these tests, but usually it is um, a list that you read that are, is read out loud. So the person, so you hear them. You hear them. Uh, so um, right. So people have different abilities in these domains. Obviously, we're not talking about something as simple as being hard of hearing, but but some people process visual information better than. Than oral, than auditory information. Um, but there are tests that use different stimuli. I mean, you can do this with different stimuli. To, even though you know the point you're making is totally valid, you'd be surprised. The results are remarkably stable, you know, across different kinds of stimuli. I have had uh, amnesia several times. Uh, it was called transient global amnesia, and it happened uh, each time. Uh, after I was uh, board sailing on the bay. Oh, I do uh, that too. Uh, do, you do that? Uh, I, yeah. I don't know if you know anyone who's had this experience. No. This not. was in the early 1980s, in the first Reagan term. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was quite his, a while. His wasn't transient. Quite a while ago. <laughs> and I had, had been sailing for quite a while, and I came, was at Berkeley, and I was putting my gear away. And uh, I knew something was wrong. I didn't know. I was confused. And fortunately, there was a big-hearted and very competent man there who happens to be here today, Don Alter. He's sitting over there. And he was, uh, was smart and intelligent. He'd been a, a ski patrol person in the mountains, so he knew what to ask a person who was confused. And he asked me who's president and that kind of thing, and he took my phone number off the, uh, it was on my gloves, and informed my family who came to fetch me. And eventually it took me to Kaiser, and that evening, after several hours, I woke up in the CAT scan down there, and where am I, and what's going on, and what, what's, every, what's all the fuss about? And the uh, person who was then the head of uh, neurology at Kaiser made an instant diagnosis that I had an ischemic event. But all the CAT scans, X-rays, MRIs showed n not a s sign of any ischemic event, and it was not. And I, uh, after a while, I returned to sailing on the bay, and um, a few years later, I had another event. It was not as serious as that one, and uh, the uh, neurologists were more cautious in saying the cause of it. And in the meantime, my daughter, who's an uh, anesthesiologist, turned up a paper which had studied some 50 people who had had these events. And they found that uh, people who were in the, un during this period, when they were am am under amnesia, in this transient amnesia, had done all kinds of things. People had given recitals, people had performed operations, people had done all <laughs> sorts of things. So. Uh, clearly, clearly, it was not a case where uh, uh, there was an ischemic event causing it. So the conclusion was, we don't know. <laughs> well, well, my question is to you: Is is uh, is there any more recent? Now, I haven't paid any attention to this for some 20 years. I quit sailing at 80, 82, <laughs> and that's been 10 years. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Is, is there any possibility that a, a partial uh, hypothermia could affect the oh, hippocampus in a way that aging does and shut down the... Uh, yeah, so, I, 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 so the, the, I mean, that story was a great example of transient global amnesia. That's exactly what it is, what you described. And um, uh, I, I guess you demonstrated two points about it. One is what your symptoms were is textbook. And uh, two is the fact that you're here to tell us about it so articulately is also part of this story <laughs> because it's a pretty benign thing. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say completely benign because there's some association with stroke, but it's not strong. And most of the time, this is not an indicator of a serious problem, which is pretty weird, right? Because it's a, it's a pretty scary thing when it, when it happens. So um, 
I, I, I'm not, a, I, I can't say that I'm up on the very latest, but the two theories about what causes this are that it is vascular, that there's not enough blood supply to the hippocampus and associated symptoms. It's like a TIA, not getting enough blood to that part of the brain. Um, it, it, the other theory is that it is uh, something like epilepsy, that it's like a seizure uh, that turns off this part of the brain for uh, a little while. Um, and I guess there's also a part of the vascular story that is like a migraine, a sort of a migrainous type of event. So it's either a vascular problem or a sort of a epileptic seizure type of problem. Those are the two theories about what causes it. But to my knowledge, I don't know anything about hypothermia. I don't uh, uh, causing it, and I don't. Uh, I, I don't know that it's any well any better understood than what I just told you. Um, but it's it's a it's got a pretty uh, it's got a pretty good prognosis. I, I have a couple of questions. The first is I've read where doing things like crossword puzzles and, and such and keeping your mind active is good for your brain. The, the, it exercises your brain and keeps it healthier. Is there anything to that? Oh, boy. <laughs> no, I, I was just thinking, I, 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 as I was coming over here, I was thinking, when am I going to talk about this? Because I wasn't planning to put it in, my, in this talk or the other talk, but... Maybe I'll try to go. I'll try to answer your question and um, and talk about it maybe a little in, in a couple of weeks. So, um, so I can tell you that there is a lot of uh, what we call observational epidemiology that suggests that when you follow people over time, people who maintain cognitive who are cognitively active, and I don't mean simply doing crossword puzzles, but all kinds of things, you know. It could be going to museums or reading books or, 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 you know, just staying engaged and active, have a lower risk of getting dementia or getting Alzheimer's disease. And those kinds of studies uh, are observational because we're just observing. We're not, we're not interacting with people. We're just following people over time. We don't do studies like this exactly in my lab, but, but, um, but if you take big samples of people and you follow them over time, this is a reliable finding that really comes up a lot. So, so that's, I think, pretty well established. So there's two questions that follow. One is, does that kind of act, active engagement prevent Alzheimer's disease? Or is the reverse possible, that people who aren't actively engaged already have Alzheimer's disease and they're dropping out? Right? They're getting less engaged, they're getting less interactive because they already are in the stage, early stages of Alzheimer's. We don't know. So that's, that's one thing. The other question is, okay, if, if, you, if you do more exercise, brain exercise, will you prevent Alzheimer's disease? Will you, will you, will you help, help your, 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 your chances? There's no evidence of that. Zero. Absolutely zero. Nada. <laughs> if you do brain exercises, there's no evidence that that prevents Alzheimer's disease. In fact, the evidence that doing brain exercise is really generally beneficial is quite weak. Um, if, you, if, you, if you do crossword puzzles, you certainly get better at crossword puzzles. <laughs> But you don't necessarily get better at, you know, Rubik's Cube. Or, 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 or. So, so the, I, I'm joking, but I'm actually totally serious that, that a lot of these brain training um, regimes train you to do something, and you really do get better at the thing you're training on, but the evidence that those generalize, either to other tests or, or games or to real life, is quite limited. Now, it's not zero. It's not zero. It's just limited. And I think... Um, this is a very active area that people are very interested in, and a lot of people think we just haven't hit the right kind of training, and that maybe if we, you know, combine physical activity and cognitive activity, because we know physical activity also is protective the same way cognitive activity is. So maybe if we combine physical activity and cognitive activity in some way, we can really have a big impact on people. But, but, but I think it's, um, it's very important to understand that there's no strong evidence of this right now. I have a second question, if I may. Uh, and that was, do we know anything at all about the molecular or cellular things that happen to the brain when they form memory? 
Oh, great question. Uh, yeah, we know a whole lot, actually. Um, do we know anything about the molecular or cellular things that happen in the brain when memories are being formed? And um, th there, we know a whole lot about that. And uh, probably, so, so there's a, uh, we think that the, um, that the molecular and cellular events that underlie memory are some, is a phenomenon called long-term potentiation, or LTP. And what LTP is uh, electrophysiologically is that when one um, nerve cell stimulates a, a, a receptor on another, uh, repeatedly, you need less stimulation to fire that second neuron. So the neuron learns, basically, that that first neuron is telling it something. And we know there are all kinds of changes in glutamate receptors and other, other uh, and GABA receptors in neurons that uh, change how neurons respond to um, inputs from other neurons. So it's a very complicated story. And to be honest with you, I'm not up on all the latest, latest parts of that story. But... Um, there are basically profound cellular and molecular changes at receptors that change the way neurons <laughs> respond. That is the cellular, we think, the cellular and molecular basis of learning. Uh, there's a lot of interest in influencing it. There's a lot of interest in developing drugs that will make it better and improve it. Uh, but I, I, I don't think there's anything quite ready for prime time. Yeah, LTP, long-term potentiation. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a feeling that a lot of people here today are interested in anything we can do to help ourselves. And so you read all the time about these things like CQ, whatever it is, and neuro, whatever it is, and, and blueberries, and chocolate, <laughs> and <laughs> caffeine, and... Yeah, so you you know... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's, the, the, those are, I mean, I, I, I get those questions all the time. And, um, you know, again, uh, uh, the, um, all of the data that we know of comes from these observational studies where we look at what people do and then see what their risks are for getting disease or, or bad outcomes as they get older. There's, if there was a clinical trial, right, where we randomized people to blueberries or, no, I'm, I'm serious, I mean, people have tried this, right? Where you literally randomize people to high blueberry diet versus something else, right? If those, if, if that worked, I'd be telling you about it, okay? There's no randomized trials of diet, exercise, cognitive training, anything like that, that we know really has a huge impact. But all of the epidemiologic studies point to the same factors over and over and over again. And you can look at those studies and you can have one of two responses. You can say, well, it's just an association and an association doesn't prove cause. And that's what I was, the point I was making with the cognitive activity. You can say cognitive activity increases your chance of a good outcome, but maybe the cause is backwards and the bad outcome is reducing cognitive activity. You can say that about anything, right? But if you look at the list of things that we know improves cognitive outcomes as we get older, you'd be crazy not to do most of them, <laughs> okay? I, I, I mean, I'm kind of joking. I'm kind of joking, but they're mom and apple pie, okay? They're things like um, uh, staying engaged in life, right? I, I mean, I don't have to ask, tell you guys that. You're here, right? Um, uh, staying physically active. Uh, physical exercise is really important. Um, treating medical illnesses, especially diseases of the vascular system, like high blood pressure and things of that sort. Probably diet. A lot of studies have pointed to this Mediterranean diet. Um, you know, I mean, to be honest with you, now you're going to get my own biases, uh, which, which are, are basically just that I, I don't think there's any food that's magic, you know, but I, I think pretty much what you know about diet, uh, being educated, you know, Berkeleyites is, is, is probably rational and correct, right? I mean, you don't want to, it's moderation, and you want a diet that doesn't have a lot of probably salt, processed food, high sugar, you know, these are all contribute to vascular disease, diabetes, and things like that. So these Mediterranean-type diets are probably beneficial. Things like that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think um, I, uh, I, I mean, I, there have been um, uh, studies now that have sort of modeled if everyone, if everyone um, you know, adhered to these diets and got physical exercise and stayed cognitively engaged and did all these things that we know are good for you, it, it actually might have an impact on the prevalence of dementia. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think 
I think it would be foolish not to try to do those things to the extent that you can. And of course, it might not. Uh, the, I have two questions, uh, one, of which, one of which goes back to one of the slides where you showed that, the, that with, with age, the hippocampal uh, was at size, I think, declines, and that the frontal lobes increase. No, they shrink, sorry. They shrink. Yeah. They both shrink. Yeah, they both shrink. Uh, so, but something improved. <laughs> something, <laughs> something improved in the, I thought in the frontal area. Not so, all bad news. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, this is really bad, but the, the good things shrink and the bad things grow. Uh, so the frontal lobe shrinks, the hippocampus shrinks, and these changes in white matter grow. These intensities, abnormal areas of white matter grow. And uh, unfortunately, those white matter areas, as they grow, are probably um, uh, not good. Yeah. All right. We'll skip that one then. I know. <laughs> My other question concerns, concerns episodic memory and, and time travel, and whether, whether you think it has any benef beneficial effect. What's it for? Could we do well without ah, episodic yeah, memory? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. There's been a lot of thinking about why, why do we have this memory? Well, I mean, there, I think there's really two, two parts of episodic memory, right? Uh, so, so to some extent, um, you know, obviously you use it to remember good things and bad things, and it's a sort of survival, survivally useful. But you don't really need it, right? I mean, I have cats, right? And I don't think they remember things that long, right? They, 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 they know, they, you know, they have very, very basic kinds of associations. And asso it's all associative in the sense that they associate, you know, certain sounds with the fact they're going to get fed and things like that. But, but you know, and you could sort of argue, what, what do we need this whole complicated system for? We don't really need it for survival. So I think a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, people have come to the idea that episodic memory is crucial for actually planning the future. That you actually can't think about what you're going to do on any long-term basis without having knowledge about what's happened to you in the past. And that, that one, of the, one of the crucial aspects of memory is actually sort of planning. Uh, planning and visualizing the future. Then you'd expect to find it in other animals and show that that this is something that evolved over time? Yeah, so I mean, um, so certainly, um, you know, non-human primates uh, are capable of forming very complex long-term memories. Um, I don't know, um, you know, I, I mean, so, so the, the, the problem is that your ability to, so I, I actually, you've stumped me. I, I mean, um, I, 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 so, so, I don't know how well we can test the richness and complexity of memories as we go lower and lower in the animal kingdom, right? Because the, aspect, the crucial aspect of, I mean, you can always find in any animal associative memory, right? Which can be in the simplest form classical conditioning where a stimulus is associated with the outcome. But, um, but I think um, the aspect of episodic memory that to me is, is interesting is it's sort of multi-dimensional complexity. And you can certainly see that with a monkey, but I'm, I don't know if you can see that with a dog or an, a rat or a mouse. Uh, I, mean, I mean, mice learn memory tasks, actually. I mean, there's a task called, a, they learn mazes, you know. Um, so I suppose that's a kind of uh, episodic memory. Okay. So my question has to do with uh, giving people lists of words and seeing if they remember them. And how does that, compare with studies where they remember things that seem to be significant or important in their lives. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, um, so, so, um, so one of the problems with memory testing is we do it in this very crude way of giving them lists of words. And that's a lot of people, including me in my lab, are very interested in trying to um, test memory in a much more, uh, in a way that's much more ecologically valid, as we would say, right? It's a, a real world kind of way, because list learning, I mean, I'm giving you the simple story here, but really there are many more interesting ways to study memory than just giving people lists of words. So um, the short answer is actually, 
Uh, this is one of the big differences uh, as we get older. Actually, our memory for things that are important to us is actually better preserved than memory for things that are sort of trivial and irrelevant. Young people are able to remember these lists of words. Older people do better when they're given a task that is sort of um, ecologically relevant to something in their lives. So that's definitely a crucial thing. Also, the emotional valence, the emotional significance of a stimulus helps its memory, right? If something really good or something really bad happens, you're more likely to remember it. And that's true across the lifespan, but it's also uh, true uh, as we get older, especially positive things. Older people are much more um, are much more biased towards rem remembering things with a positive emotional valence than with a negative emotional valence. So, so there really are differences in in um, in, in, in the types of st things we remember as we get older. And I mean, those are those are some examples. And again, I I mean, I think. Um, you know, I didn't really have time. I was trying to give you the basics, but there's a tremendously vast literature on different ways of testing memory. And some of them are designed to take apart episodic memory and get at its essential core features. And I, I think I'll talk a bit about that in a couple of weeks. And others are much more designed to get at this sort of ecological framework of, of how relevant a memory is in some way and how real world it is. So for example, in my lab now, we're actually experimenting with showing people movies and trying to see how well they can remember a movie. We think a film clip, a short clip, would be more relevant to them than just a list of words, for example, and stuff like that. In terms of uh, hippocampal size, wasn't there a study uh, many years ago of London cab drivers uh, showing that their hippocampus uh, increased? Uh, greatly, and if so, do I have to become a uh, London cab driver to preserve my? Yeah, capacity? so you're you're re you are remembering that correctly. Um, uh, <laughs> although it didn't quite show that it that they had a change in their hippocampus. What they did show is that cab drivers had a bigger hippocampus than some other occupation. I can't. They didn't follow them over time. They just it was a single point in time. I, I'm I'm pretty sure. Maybe I'm misremembering it. But, but, um, you know, but to that point, there have also been studies that um, violinists have uh, bigger areas of their cerebral cortex devoted to their fingers, uh, finger areas of their, of their brain, right? Um, and so um, I think these studies are largely interpreted as plasticity, that the brain, um, the brain develops in, 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 uh, in areas where it's used and needed. And um, when that happens during life, uh, is not clear. Uh, does it happen when you're 70 or does it happen when you're 12? Um, and there is, I think some of these data are a little controversial in the sense that we don't always know if it was the hippocampal size, if it was the being a cab driver that, that, that drove the hippocampus or whether the hippocampus, they were so good at these things that they became cab drivers. You know, they had an aptitude or a violinist or something like that. But there are undoubtedly data to show in monkeys that there's plasticity, just like that, that, that parts of the brain can take over and expand. And this is true across the animal kingdom, actually. Besides the um, Mediterranean diet and physical activity, can you speak to some of what I've read recently about the impact of meditation? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I have a colleague who's... So I don't know how good the science is about the impact on the impact of meditation. I, I, I just honestly don't know. I, I have a colleague um, who is doing a study of this right now. A, she has a big grant from the, the... She's in France, and the EU has funded a big study of meditation and aging. Uh, a really, really big, you know, multi-center, like seven million euros or something like that. So, so they really are serious about looking at this. And, um, uh, but you know, obviously that tells you that there's some la data lacking if, if if they need to do that. So I, I don't really know. I'll be honest with you uh, that there's really conclusive data about this. I have a question. I have a question about uh, whether alcohol or marijuana kill brain cells or what kind of an impact it has if you have Alzheimer's or if you don't have Alzheimer's? Um, you know, I, 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 so I, I think, so I don't know about marijuana, to be honest. Um, I, I think you have, to, you have to drink a whole lot of alcohol to kill brain cells. Um, you certainly can. <laughs> <laughs> You certainly can't. You so, so this guy I showed you, um, 
This guy showed you his problem actually was from alcohol, but it's actually not the alcohol itself that does it. It's a vitamin deficiency that does it. Um, they get a deficiency in thiamine, when, uh, and that's what causes it. So I think you really, uh, I think the evidence that alcohol or marijuana really, you know, kills brain cells is pretty limited. Now, I'm not recommending that you go out and get drunk or high. I, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't really, I don't think that heavy alcohol or marijuana use is, has beneficial cognitive effects. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I guess moderation, you know, that's, that's. What happened to him? What kind of a life was he able to You know, I lost touch with him, I don't know, but, but he undoubtedly had to live in an in a, uh, assisted living facility. He could not live independently, I'm, I'm sure of that. And he, he didn't get any better, I can tell you that, because that was like two months after his, 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 uh, his he'd, he'd recovered. This was as good as he was going to get. Uh, I was going to ask you about the uh, effect on the uh, hippocampus as you approach a black hole, but um, <laughs> <laughs> more, more significantly, uh, uh, what do we know about the, uh, what happens to someone with eidetic memory uh, yeah. as they get older, and, and does that deteriorate in, in some unusual way? So, uh, so eidetic memory, for those of you who haven't heard this term, is like a, uh, you know, photographic memory or something like that. So, so actually, I have a colleague uh, at Irvine who's been studying this. I don't know. He was actually on 60 Minutes, the guy uh, who studies this. is uh, Craig Stark is his name, and um, he's a cognitive neuroscientist, and he's been, he's been recruiting these people who have uh, remarkable memory, and um, it's not quite photographic, um, but they can tell you precisely what they were doing at a particular, at any time, like of, at any time, at any place in their past, and it's just uncanny, and they have, you know, corroborative evidence of these kinds of things, and um, so, and I, I so, so the, 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 uh, the, the, Sad news is I can't tell you very much about how this happens. Um, I don't think they, I don't think the people studying them can tell you very much about how it happens, and I certainly can't tell you what happens to them as they get older. Most of these people are young or middle-aged. What I did learn about these folks is that they're remarkably self-centered. <laughs> so, so I, I don't mean that exactly in the bad way that you think of self-centered. I, I, I don't mean it like you know like exactly in that way. They're just very focused on what's happening to them all the time. And um, uh, so I, I, don't, I, I don't really know very much more about, the, about it than that. Yeah. Uh, I find that um, I can recognize people's by when, I, when they speak, I, I have a much better chance of recognizing them and knowing, knowing that I know them as opposed to when I just look at their faces. Uh -huh. And I can remember words to songs that I've heard, you know, decades ago, but other things like, you know, lists of words, other things like that, I'm not really good at. So the question is, is there something in the brain, uh, particularly to the strategies of, of how I might be doing that, that um, differentiates well, I, between, you know, the kinds of things I'm good at remembering and the kinds of things I'm not good at remembering? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to answer your question, but I am going to talk about something that I find really interesting. Um, and uh, so, so I, I mean, just to triv a trivial answer to your question, as we know, people have remarkable differences in all kinds of things that we would all consider pretty basic, right? Like, you know, hearing, hearing music and remembering tunes and things of that sort. But, but I think there's a very interesting example that you um, sort of brought up, which is our recognizing faces. And there's a disorder called prosopagnosia. Um, and prosopagnosia is a condition where uh, you literally cannot recognize people by their faces. And in the extreme forms, this is caused by strokes, and it's caused by strokes in the area, of the, there is an area of the brain that's involved in facial recognition. It's actually quite specialized for, for faces. And if you have a stroke that either affects that area or cuts it off from the rest of the brain, um, you will have uh, you, you will be unable to recognize faces, even faces of people you know very well, 
but you'll be able to recognize them by the sound of their voice, for example. Um, what's really interesting is that this syndrome also occurs uh, uh, from genetic causes, and so there are families that have familial prosopagnosia. I can't imagine what a family reunion is like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry if I offended anyone. Um, <laughs> uh, that just occurred to me. But, 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 um, but literally, but, and also the other thing is it's something that occurs on a continuum. So it's probably a multigenic kind of thing that, I mean, I, I, I'm interested in this because I'm actually bad at recognizing faces. Uh, and it's not memory. It's not like, it's not like, I can't remember the person. It's like you really can't recognize faces that well. And if you think about it, it's a remarkable skill, right? Because on some level, everyone's face is the same, right? I mean, I, I know that's not true, right? But the basic, the basic features of a face are very, very simple, and they're, they're all the same. But yet, obviously, we're all incredibly different. And the ability to sort out these differences is an extremely complicated computational process. And there are some people who just... Um, who, who are just really good at it, and other people are really bad at it. And uh, actually, there was a great story in the New Yorker about this, know, about this police, these, this police unit in the Great Britain that, that is really, they've, they've, um, they've gathered together people who are really good at this uh, facial recognition. So, I mean, all of these things occur on natural continua. The facial recognition is particularly interesting because there's been a sort of genetic story and there's a neuro, neuroscience story to it. But my guess is this happens with many, many things that we take for granted every day. You, you talked about um, change on the molecular level and uh, needing less stimulus over time. Yeah. And um, I suffer from chronic pain and have been told that it's only going to get worse because of that and that, that you can't really, you, you can't break that. It, it'll just get worse. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know much about the um, molecular mechanisms of chronic pain, but I, I, I doesn't. It wouldn't surprise me. If there's something about learning in there, right? That that neuron, because the problem is that neurons are firing, uh, you know, for no reason, right? There's not a, there, you know, pain is a very adaptive response. We need it to avoid things that are potentially harmful. Uh, and at some point, uh, something in your nervous system has learned that there's harm when there isn't any. Um, so it's, it is a learning of some sort, and I, I, but I don't, I'm really not. So one of the things they do to treat chronic pain is they give drugs that block some of these receptors that are involved in long-term potentiation, right? They're trying to stop this whole process. Um, but um, other than that, I don't have a great knowledge about the topic. Uh, yes, in your 1994 study, the subject was able to do the arithmetic function very easily. Wasn't there some memory process involved in that as well? Right, so that's that short-term or sort of working memory that I'm talking about. So he, he had to remember that for like, you know, uh, just long enough to subtract, right? It's like, again, it's just not that different than but going... But the whole function of how to do it, isn't that part of a long-term uh, memory? It's a different... No, not really. I mean, so, so I mean, uh, it's like, it's the same thing that if, um, if I gave him seven numbers to recall, like, you know, a phone number, right? He could say it right back to me. He could probably say it back to me backwards, okay? Because people who have memory problems can do stuff like that. He probably could have inverted the string of numbers and read them back to me backwards just using his head uh, because that, num that, that information was in a part of his brain that didn't require the hippocampus to store. And the same thing with the subtraction, right? I mean, it's just like he could do so many things. You could say, well, you know, doesn't speaking involve memory? Well, yeah, I mean, sort of. You had a, you know, but 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 memory for words is completely different than memory for something that happened to you, right? That's that's so that that's, leads to my other, which is about uh, the inability to uh, remember names of restaurants, streets, books, that kind of thing seems to be one of the earliest things to go. And is do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a very common. Uh, problem as we get older, um, remembering words. Um, it's not quite, it's semantic actually. That's a, it's a funny type of memory that doesn't fit into any of the things we've been talking about very well. You know, it, I'm fascinated by it and I don't understand it. Maybe that's why I'm fascinated by it. But, but um, it's definitely not the same as episodic memory, right? I mean, you're not, I mean, you know, um, a restaurant, right? I mean, you, you know the restaurant. Right, and when someone tells it to you, you say, "Of course, right." It's just you can't come up with it at that second, right? 
Um, so it's not that you've really forgotten it. You just can't come up with it. I think it has something to do with your frontal lobes accessing it somehow and you know, so getting, pulling the memory out. You know. But um, I don't understand it. It's really, it is interesting though. But, and I, I'm not sure that it's pathologic. I, well, I mean, it happens as you get older, so it's probably not good. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's Alzheimer's disease. Questions. <laughs> what one? Have you ever seen a hippocampus? And do you think that that structure in the brain really, truly looks like a hippocampus? I, I've seen hippocampi. Uh, I've seen you know like preserved seahorses. I haven't. Yes. I don't think I've ever seen a live one. They have them not uh, at the marine. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen them. Um, uh, I mean, you know, neuroscientists are a little. You know, loose. these were ancient Greeks. Yeah, I mean, you know, but all these things, you know, there's another part of the brain called an, the amygdala. It's right in front of the hippocampus, yes. and that's supposed to be an almond. Amygdala comes from almond, right? Yeah. And it's kind of almond shape, but yeah, I mean. Thank you. Thank you very much for. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, if you are, yeah, you can keep post a those library. Of well, the, I use this. I mean, here's the only thing. Yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Yeah, yeah.